I had Pakistan as favourites to make the World Test Championship finals in this cycle. Was it that I thought they were in great test form? It was more about the fact that I thought they only had to sleepwalk their way through to them. Outside of Sri Lanka, they had by far the easiest schedule of any of the major test teams. This is the last knot. My dad told me to say this. But if you want form, it was patchy, but there. At the back half of 2020, they went winless across five tests against England and New Zealand. But then they came home and they rolled South Africa 2-0, and then they won easily in Zimbabwe. I wasn't expecting them to beat anyone better than them, just compete with teams in favourable conditions. They had a lot of non-Asian teams that were going to have to come to Pakistan, and the series when they were touring were against lower ranked sides. Essentially, all I expected them to do was be about as good as they had been before. Nothing more, nothing less. As it currently stands in this WTC cycle, Pakistan has won less than half their matches. Sri Lanka, the other team with the great schedule, have a 5-4 and four record. And when this cycle started, it would have been crazy to suggest that Sri Lanka would do better than Pakistan. But they are. And part of that reason is that Sri Lanka squared a series with Pakistan at home. But they also took a test off Australia, which I think, as we know, has not been easy in this cycle. And you will remember, Pakistan failed to do that in three attempts. There is no doubt that Pakistan has been a stinking hot mess in this tournament. And so I wanted to go through and take a look at why that is the case. On the surface level, Pakistan's batting looks great. Baba has averaged 62 in the WTC and made 1,200 runs while doing it. Good enough for third on the highest run scorers. Abdullah Shafiq has put together a Manus Labashain start to his career so far. And it certainly looks like one of the best players in the world under 25 by a distance. Imam Al-Haq has been a star in his seven tests as well. Then you have Azza Ali, Mohamed Rizwan, both being muted, but still averaging mid-30s, which is certainly not a dumpster fire. But the real problem with Pakistan is that their batting kind of drops off at the number five position. At numbers six, seven, and eight, it's been pretty rough. All three spots are underperforming, and that means that even when Pakistan is batting well, you know you have a big chance of getting back on top just by getting to four wickets. That's a huge advantage when you're playing them. You can see when you look at this graph that they're just not as strong in that period. And this is by design. They are not doing this by accident. There is a reason why they're not as good. These are the players who have batted at spot 6, 7, and 8 during this cycle. There are a lot of names here that do not scream batting. But I want to focus on a few. Let's start with Mohamed Rizwan. Fair to say he is not the problem here. As a number 7, he would be outstanding. As a number 6, I think he's probably good enough. But there's something worth noting here. When he started playing for Pakistan, he was a number seven, giving Pakistan very long batting depth. Even if they dropped off at number eight, at number seven, you basically had a test quality player. But of course, when you have a wicketkeeper who can bat as good as him, and you're batting them at number seven, there's always a temptation to move him even further up the order. This year, he has started test matches listed at six, five, and four. And when he's batting higher than number six, that usually means that the team is gonna have an incredibly shaky middle to lower order. And even when he is just batting at six, he can't fix all of their issues. But let's look at the rest. Agar Selman is an all-rounder who bowls a tiny bit. He's batted everywhere except opening in first-class cricket, and he averages 39 in the first-class game. But I think he's probably more of a number seven at this level. So far, they've had to use him a lot more at number six. Fahim Ashraf is next worth looking at. He averages 29 in first-class cricket, and he should be a pesky number eight at best at test level but he's actually batted at number seven for them. And that is clearly too high. But if you look at his overall career, his average is 28, which is probably a bonus, all things considered, of what you would assume to get out of him. In 2021, he averaged 38 with a bat. However, this year, it has been seven. And then you have Mohamed Nawaz, everyone's favorite left arm death seamer. As a batter, he's probably somewhere between Salman and Fahim but he's failed so far in Test Match Cricket with an average of 16. I think he's obviously better than that. But whether you can get an average of him over 30, I think that's fairly unlikely. And again, he's probably another guy who is suited to batting at number seven, perhaps even a number eight. All of these players are second skill guys. Rizwan keeps and the others all bowl to various levels, which means that while this looks like it's the problem, I think the real issue here is that Pakistan is trying to fit in another all-rounder to this team. This is happening right across Test Cricket at the moment. 
And that's because of how many test matches are played back to back. You really need a fifth bowling option. And also that the old fashioned real part timers don't exist anymore because batters just don't bowl in the nets that much these days. So you have to actually bring a fifth option in rather than just chucking the ball to a batter. But I think Pakistan is a much better team when they have a number six who was strong and even arguably a number seven who was as well. And if you go back to 2010 until the middle of 2016, which is when they were crowned the test champions of the world, Asad Shafiq was batting at number six for them. No younger player has ever had a longer apprenticeship in that position than he has. And because of that, he had actually scored the third most runs at number six ever. In fact, at the time, he had the second most runs until Stokes recently went past him. Of course, the reason that players don't last at six that long is that mostly it's a multi-use batting position. It's used for players being eased into or eased out of the game and for all-rounders. Shafiq started as a young player getting experience, but then Pakistan never moved him up perhaps stunting his growth, also giving themselves a middle order of Yunus Khan, Misbah al Haq, and Asad Shafiq. And that also meant that for quite a few tests, they could use Safras Ahmed as a number seven, where he would average around 36 with a strike rate of 70. But there was a couple of other reasons why they could have that kind of batting order. They had two special spinners in that era as well, Saeed Ajmal and Yassir Shah. They could both deliver millions of overs at home or away with decent economy and also take a lot of wickets. So the need for a fifth bowler was far less. If you compare that to the spin bowling in this cycle, it's been largely Naman Ali, who has 18 wickets at 47 in this World Test Championship. He is definitely a better player than that. But none of the spinners they've tried other than Abrad Ahmed's recent two tests have really looked that threatening. And none of this has been helped by the fact that Yasser Shah has gone from the quickest bowler in the history of the game to take 200 wickets to someone who seems to have forgotten what they even look like. Yasser has become the leg spinning Benjamin Button. He's aging in reverse. Leggies are supposed to get better when they are old. And he's looked washed for quite some time now. And in that Shafiq period where they became number one, no Pakistani fans are going to be happy with me calling it that, but that's what it was. They didn't just have lead tweakers, they also had decent backups in the top order. Muhammad Hafiz. During that period, he bowled almost 500 overs. He took only 44 wickets, but at 30 with a low economy. Towards the end of that, his action was deemed illegal. So even during that period, they started to lose that advantage, but Yasir Shah overcame that. So that means that in their peak period, Pakistan could have Safraz batting in his best position. Shafiq could give them a specialist batter at number six, and Hafiz could bowl as a holding bowler away and a strike bowler at times in the UAE. None of that exists anymore. And because this is Pakistan, think of how long I've gone without mentioning pace bowlers. In that six and a half year period, Pakistan did not have a quick take more than 70 wickets. They just rotated through Janaid Khan, Umar Gul, Rahat Ali, Wahab Riaz, Imran Khan, Tanvir Ahmed, and Sohail Khan. If someone got injured, they just found someone new. They didn't seem to have any great development in their system or thought process in picking them. Just find someone who's bold seen and give them a game. Maza Ashad actually did a video with Nasser Hussain on the Pakistan team recently, and they talked about the quick bowlers all being injured at the moment. But there's something very interesting about this. Other than the young quick Dahani, all of these are multi-format bowlers. Pakistan doesn't seem to have a structured rest pattern for them. Instead, what happens is they pick them when they are fit. Now, injuries can happen to anyone. We've seen England have a lot of injuries to their fast bowlers, and they have actually tried to rest them a lot better. But the interesting thing for Pakistan here is that this is actually what they were doing before when they were winning. They would just rotate through seamers, whoever was fit, available, and in form at the time. But they did that with at least one red-hot spinner on the side and a top-order player who's a very good part-timer who didn't weaken the batting. Of course, it is worth wondering what it would be like with Shaheen Afridi fit all the time, as in this WTC, he's taken 41 wickets at an average of 18. Even Hassan Ali looked unplayable at times against South Africa and Zimbabwe. But on some of these pitches at home, it's probably good that they haven't played. And we do have to talk about these wickets. In the UAE, you can throw the ball to decent spinners and not worry much about the quicks at all. That's not the case in Pakistan. There is a reason that reverse swing, the dusra, finger wrongens and the wobble ball were all perfected by Pakistanis. Their pitches are so flat that you often don't have a choice. To get the ball to move sideways, you have to do whatever you can. And these pitches have been like that. Even so much so that Ramiz Raja, who actually lost his chairman job while I was writing this, finally mentioned. That was a big deal because during the Australian series, they were banning commentators from slamming the shit pitches. He laid the blame at the fact that Pakistan had not been in test for a long time. So let's look at the receipts on that one. This is the average runs per wicket for all the test matches since Pakistan started hosting games at home again. You can see that they had three early on where the average was under 30 against Bangladesh and then two against South Africa. And then the pitches got mysteriously flatter again after that. 
Also, as we're more than aware, first class surfaces at some of these grounds have produced better cricket than the turf. The thing about these batting pitches is that it also has played into Pakistan struggling in this cycle. Against Australia and England, what they really needed more than anything else was result wickets. And for the first four tests of these two series combined, they produced basically wickets that were only fit for draws. England forced one victory through and Australia just got home in another one. But it would be hard to say that Pakistan was giving themselves the best chance of getting results, which is exactly what you want at home during a World Test Championship. And if the only way to get a result is for one team to score at almost seven runs and over for 600 runs, then something has gone very wrong with your wickets. There is no doubt that injuries have played a part. Plus, the lack of an all-rounder who can deliver enough runs or enough high-quality balls. Their spinners are nowhere near the same quality, and it does seem like they are overburdening their quicks in all formats. And it's not the player's fault that their wickets are not conducive to results. But remember, I thought they had such a favourable run in this championship that they could qualify for the final without playing that well. They're currently 7th behind the West Indies. And if you use the ICC predictor, you can see that they have New Zealand at home soon. So let's quickly use this to go through a few of the results of these tests. Let's say that Pakistan beats New Zealand twice. It's a weakened Kiwi side, um, and that should at least be the thought process of Pakistan. But afterwards, New Zealand then hosts Sri Lanka. There's every chance that they might win both of those. So if Pakistan win their next two test matches, and then New Zealand win the next two after that, Pakistan actually end up at eighth. They go down lower. There were many things beyond Pakistan's control here. Injuries, Australia being this good, and England's sudden new rise. But Pakistan let West Indies take a test with a 17-run last wicket partnership. They produced wickets against Australia that even if they were a better side, they would have struggled to make results on. They got thumped by Sri Lanka in a test at goal. And then they produced wickets at home that allowed England to bat like ODIs. And then despite numerous chances to claw their way back into those tests, they never looked like they had it within them. The truth of the World Test Championship as an overall concept is that while being a good team helps, there are going to be cycles where a team just has a huge chance of making the finals based on their schedules and other years where it'll be really tough no matter how well they play. This was the easy one for Pakistan and they could not have made it look tougher if they tried.